So in the same way as you have with um, this classical computing, you also have different models within quantum computing. So there are two that I'm going to talk about, and the first one is called the gate model, which is the sort of standard most people think of when they hear quantum computing. And there's also another model which is called adiabatic quantum computing, which is actually almost in a way doing better than the gate model in terms of what people are trying to make at the moment. So I'll just, I'll just explain a bit about those two. So here are some diagrams from the standard gate model. And this is the a schematic of the idea of the gate model. And it's what I just explained on the previous slides. You have quantum inputs, you put them into registers, they're entangled, you get a quantum output, and um, the whole thing runs a bit like a digital computer, kind of uh, synchronously. And this is what lots of people have been working on already. So some of you might have heard of IBM's 7 qubit molecular computer. And this is using the NMR technique I described earlier. But you essentially get these um, spins on different, state, um, on different positions in the molecule to become entangled with one another. And then you can run operations on this computer using the same model. That's and one molecule, is it? Yeah, that's just one molecule. Yeah. But in order to actually read out the system, you need a large ensemble of these. And you just hope that they're all doing the same thing at the same time. So really, you're looking at the quantumness of single spins, but because they all do the same thing, you're actually taking an average. So some people actually think that this isn't true quantum computing, in a way, because you're actually looking at a large number of systems. Now, these are some examples of the superconducting qubits I was just describing. And here is an example where four of them have been coupled together and they are um, becoming entangled together and you can perform gate operations on them like this. And here's another example where two of them are coupled together. And as far as I know, four is the maximum of this model so far. So you can, um, you can only run very, very simple things on this at the moment. For example, uh, you can make what's called a controlled knot gate. So this is where the quantum system flips its state if one of the control lines is active and it doesn't if it isn't. So this is like, if you like, this is a very simple basic building block of a much larger system. It's, it's, a, it's a logic gate, essentially. So you can see why this model isn't actually very advanced because it's still at the stage of making single logic gates and them not being able to talk to each other yet because you can't maintain the coherence across many of these things. So that's why the gate model of quantum computing is um, its considered the standard model, but it's not really actually got very far yet in terms of what you can do. And this is just a slide to show you how you might check the quantum behavior of a typical gate model system. So you would um, apply a pulse of microwaves or photons or some other signal to your qubit and what you can actually observe is it moving between the states 0 and 1. And this is like a test that people do to check how well the qubits are operating. And it's also what people mean when they talk about decoherence time. So it's how long you can keep the quantum system um, in a superposition form before it just becomes completely um, impossible to, to um, tell apart these two states. So uh, at the start you can see that it's got quite a lot of uh, contrast between the zero state and the one state, and you can see it going between the superpositions in between. But by the end you can see the zero and the one states get much, much more difficult to tell apart, and at that point you've not really got a, proper, a properly design, um, defined zero and one state, so you can't really uh, measure it very well anymore, and it starts to leak between them. Sorry, and that, that is due to what? De decoherence in the environment? Yes, yeah. yeah. I'll talk a little bit about some of the sources of decoherence in, in a little while. Okay, so the other model I mentioned is the um, adiabatic quantum computing model. And this is also quite popular. And this is um, a much more natural way of actually doing quantum computation. So, so far the methods have um, involved transferring quantum information using gates, using qubits as gates. 
and this is sort of similar to conventional computing using transistor logic. So that's actually quite an intuitive system, and AQC is a bit more um, it's a bit more difficult, I think, to 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 understand. But what when you understand it's a more natural way of computing, then it kind of makes sense. So it works by finding the minimum energy of a system, and lots and lots of problems in everyday life can be actually mapped onto this idea of finding the minimum energy of a system. And if anyone's heard of a technique called simulated annealing in programming, it works very similar to this. So I'll just explain this method. So how simulated annealing works is you start with um, a disordered system, and what you're trying to find is you're trying to find the lowest energy state of a system, and this might be a collection of spins, or um, it could be qubits, or something like this, but you're trying to find the lowest energy state under a particular set of conditions. So what you do is you set the system to a high temperature, which means you're likely to get lots of transitions between different energy states. These things flip up and down quite often. And then you slowly, slowly lower the temperature. And the idea is that the system should find the global minimum of the energy, of the possible configuration, sorry, that this, that this thing can take. And that should correspond to the ground state of the system. And you'll find that you have to very slowly lower the temperature um, in order to do this. Do you mean the actual temperature? Like the actual fridge temperature? In a real quantum system you do actually um, you do actually change the temperature, but you also change things like the magnetic field conditions as well. And that can correspond to the physical interpretation of the temperature. Yeah. I mean most people do this just with computer simulations and they just have a parameter which causes jumps between mm. these two I was states. Just thinking that that, that with the parameter, then it simulates mm. annealing, but if you actually know the temperature, it's actually annealing. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Okay, so the idea behind quantum annealing is that you do exactly the same thing. You start with the disorder system, and then the, as you change the temperature or the parameter, your system can jump between the levels, but it can also quantum tunnel through the energy barrier. So the idea is that it can find the global minimum much more easily and much more quickly because it doesn't get stuck in the local minimums. It doesn't have as much of a chance of jumping back to a higher energy configuration. So it finds the, this minimum ground state much more quickly. <coughs> and so what on earth does this have to do with real world problems? So I'm going to um, explain a little bit about how this system is made and then talk about some of the applications it could be used for. Um, so here's an example of one that's actually been made. So there are lots of qubits here and they're all coupled together just like the spins in the diagram. And this has actually been made on a chip by this company called D-Wave. And it's the most advanced uh, qubit coupling <coughs> scheme so far. Here's one with 16 qubits, they now have 128 qubits. So when people ask you how many qubits do people have, again you say, well if it's a diabetic quantum computing they have hundreds of them, if it's gate model they have four. Okay. So um, because you don't need to control each individual qubit, like um, individual transistors, you can just couple them and let them all talk to each other, then you can scale this system up quite easily. Okay, and I'll just talk a little bit about decoherence. Now, the main reason that we have problems with quantum computing is this thing known as decoherence, which um, means you can no longer tell the difference between your states 0 and 1 because the system is interacting with the environment. And this actually causes the states to become mixed together and they become entangled and coupled in with other states and they're no longer a nice, pure, isolated quantum system. And here are some... Whoops, sorry. Here are some um, examples of things that can cause decoherence. So you can have electric fields from nearby equipment, magnetic fields, thermal noise, as I discussed previously, can cause the um, can cause a, a jump in the quantum system. And defects in this is what I mean by this is in actually in the material itself. If there is a dislocation in the crystal, that can cause a charge to hop about, and that can also then produce some ex electric fields and magnetic fields. So all these things act together to destroy your coherence. What about neutrinos? 